Welcome to the Daily DLP. I'm your host, Ash Thompson, and today I'm going to be digging into the Lions' win over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Let's get it on. If you want to see my immediate reactions to the game, those came out Monday. Gray's look at the game came out yesterday. And Zach's studs and duds from the game should be coming up sometime later this week. Of course, Chris and Jeff touch on it as well, and so do Bischoff and Brown. So if you want to hear about the Lions' last game, one of those has to be giving you what you want. If it says Daily DLP, that's always this guy. Quick hits? Gray. Every single time that quick hits is written on the episode title. Studs and duds? Always Zach. If it's got a number... That's Jeff and Chris. And if it says Bischoff and Brown, shockingly, that's going to be Bischoff and Brown. So, if you were shocked to show up here today to the premiere of this video and find yourself appalled by seeing little old me on the screen, you feel the need to spout off about how much you hate my episodes. These have been coded the entire time you just couldn't figure it out. Like and subscribe, hate and complain. You do you. But at least now you know how to find the content you actually want to see on this channel. We all scratch a different itch. Mine's about four inches in, towards the front, where it feels just a little bit rougher. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about the secondary. I've seen a lot of talk about how the only reason the Lions' defense looked good was missed deep balls by Baker. If you were watching the Bucks preview I did last week, you know that the last thing you need to be concerned about is Baker completing deep passes. He's just not good at it, hasn't been doing it all year. And that's not to say that I think letting Josh Palmer go free downfield was some sort of master stroke by Aaron Glenn or intentional in any way. There were some definite gaps in the secondary this week. The Lions' safeties just didn't seem to be on the same page a lot of the time, and the Bucks did a great job of particularly targeting Kirby Joseph and putting him into spots where he didn't really have a good decision. On a specific mid-game attempt to Josh Palmer downfield that I think is the one that's probably seeing the most traction on Twitter in terms of when people are saying that this is the only reason the Lions did well is because they could, the Bucks couldn't hit those, Kirby was forced to either give Cam Sutton over-the-top help he was expecting down the right sideline against Mike Evans. Or, stick with Josh Palmer as his route went into Tracy Walker's deep half of the field. He chose to maintain his help with Evans. That, in this case, was probably the wrong choice, but it's an entirely understandable one for a safety to make. And the Bucks know this. The thing is, Tracy didn't see Palmer's route developing and Kirby didn't see that Walker wasn't deep enough to take it. Walker was busy on his side of the field, uh, because Chris Godwin ran also another deep route uh, that Jerry Jacobs had let go when it left his zone. Godwin pushed like he was going to go deep, deep, deep down the sideline, and then as soon as he got past that second level and they let him go, he broke off the route just behind the linebackers and Jerry. In the end... Kirby's supposed to stick with the deepest guy, and he just got beat. But it was just a moment of hesitation, because he had reason to believe that there was another guy on the back end where Palmer was headed, basically. just And he just kind of ended up leaving that guy wide open deep down the field. But if Walker lets Godwin go, that's a 20-yard completion. Uncontested, plus a whole bunch of yak. And that's what the Bucks have been relying on all year basically, is just that route being open for a great deal of yards after the catch. When I talk about designing plays that put the safeties into conflict and hitting whatever guy they choose not to cover because they have to choose, there's only two of them and there are three people going deep. One of them is not going to be covered. Unless everybody makes compensatory decisions. Like Cam Sutton stayed with. Evans, because there was nothing short on his side. Which would have left 
Kirby Joseph free to go with Josh Palmer into Tracy Walker's zone after Walker went short. But like I said, Joseph just didn't notice that Walker had done this, was expecting a guy to be there, but he still just straight up got beat deep. Like he can't let a guy get deeper than him either. But it wasn't all bad in the secondary. I mean, the Lions defense had nine passes defended against the Bucks. Some of those were tip balls at the line of scrimmage. But nonetheless, I told you after week one that if the Lions could keep up the pace that they had set against the Chiefs of five per game, they were going to have a little bit less than 25 more passes defended this year than they had last year. And six games in, they are actually exceeding that. They're on pace for almost 30, like 29 points something more passes defended than they had all of last season. And that's with James Houston not being there to rush the passer and create the mayhem that he did. That's with C.J. Gardner-Johnson, who they signed because he breaks up passes and intercepts them, gone. That's Branch, same reason he was brought in. He is also not playing recently. Last year, Kirby Joseph, Joseph and Jerry Jacobs led the team with eight each. This year, Jacobs... Alex Anzalone, Branch, and Aiden Hutchinson are all halfway or more to that number eight just six weeks in. Kirby is also on pace to match his number from last year. The Lions are also eighth in the league in interceptions. So hats off to the secondary. Uh, they've taken a lot of heat, but the numbers don't really back that up, particularly not this week where they set their season high with nine passes defended. Like If you take half of those away, and you're adding four or five completions to Baker's number, this is an entirely different ball game. The Lions secondary took the game away too. On the other side of the ball, this was the Lions' greatest output in terms of net passing yards, and lowest net rushing yards on the season. The Lions passed more than they've passed at any point in this year, and ran less than they've run at any point in this year. And analytics guys will tell you that that's how you win games. But somehow, the Lions managed the lowest point total they've had all season. I'm just stating factual events that occurred. As they happened on a football field. What conclusions you would like to draw from them, that's entirely on you. But my conclusion is that this is what happens when you can't run the ball. The Lions didn't have a single 10-yard run in this game for the first time all year. The return of Kalaji Kansi to the Bucks D-line was significant in its impact. Basically, all of their guys were suddenly slotted into roles that they better fit. Which is the same thing that Isaiah Bucks did for the Detroit Lions defense. It just puts the guys into spots that they are good at doing. And I mean, the Lions were also down two starting guards. That kind of hampers your ability to run the game just a little bit. But the loss of David Montgomery, particularly, is something the Lions can't deal with if Jameer Gibbs is also out of the lineup. Like, having both of these guys not play is something that the Lions are not presently set up to manage. Now, particularly with two guards also out, that is just... Run game's going away until that is fixed. There's not really a solution to that other than just blocking better and running better, which asking the same group of people to just get better at a thing with another week of practice, they might, but who knows? But even with that, the Lions had the highest third down percentage of the season in terms of their offensive conversions. Uh, conversely, the defense allowed the smallest conversion rate at 16.7. That's two for 12 on the, for the Bucks offense in this game on third down. The Lions also scored in all four quarters for the first time since week two. The Lions maintained their undefeated streak when leading after the first quarter. All five of their wins, they were leading at the end of the first quarter. No Lions interior defensive lineman graded below a 60 from PFF, with Olin McNeil and Benito Jones both scoring over 70. That is a marked change 
<laughs> uh, the IDL is really stepped up. They really stepped up in this game and did great. Uh, Aiden Hutchinson, weirdly enough, had his worst grade of the season in this game at a 59.8, which is, you know, 0. 0.2 below like a good game. That's the scale. Uh, the only linebackers that saw defensive snaps this week were Alex Anzalone, Jack Campbell, and Derek Barnes. Anzalone led the way with an 81.6. Campbell got a 66.7. And Barnes had an uncharacteristically low 59.9. But again, one under bad, one under good. 0.1 under good. They continue to hate Will Harris, giving him a 29.8. But this week, I'm not going to sit here defending Will Harris. I don't think he had a particularly good game either. But Jerry Jacobs, 74.3. And Cam Sutton. 81.8. That rounds out the corner group. It's part of why the secondary did so well. Two out of the three guys had a really good game. Uh, Kirby Joseph also got a wag of the finger from PFF with a 27.9 grade. And Tracy Walker's ruthless but completely legal hitting got him a 63.9. On the year, the Lions have allowed the fewest rushing yards in the league this season, despite having played in one more game than about 20% of the league. They've allowed fewer than the Eagles, despite having faced more carries. The difference in yards per carry between those two teams is almost one-third of a yard. They're the top two run defense teams. And the defense is tied overall for fifth in yards per play allowed. The defense is tied for eighth in the fewest penalties. And those penalties have given opponents the sixth least free yardage on the year. The injury list has included some big names like Branch, Gibbs, Jackson, Pascal, and Baitai all sitting out, but the Lions got it done this week with a solid team effort on defense and a few big plays from the offense to close it out. Whether you want more content like this or not, hit like and subscribe below. Then go to the shop. Links that you see down there. Buy some stuff. We also have a promo code with Manscaped. So, if you want to be as smooth in the sheets as you are in the streets, go get some products to facilitate that too. The code's posted below and it's in the show notes. Tomorrow, I'm going to be previewing the Baltimore offense. I've been looking forward to this one all year. So in case I don't see you, good morning, good afternoon, and good night.